Right, fantastic. Warm welcome, folks, to Future Work Scotland. I'm your host for this evening, Sath Pal Singh. Nobody calls me Sath. I'm joined by my co host, Donald Henderson and Nicola Bennett. Um, as this is an Agile 20 Reflect Festival, I've just got a few formalities to go through. Um, let me just find my slides. Hopefully you can see this. This will take a couple of minutes. So yeah, as I say, very warm welcome to you. This is the second of the Future Awards Scotland events in support of the Agile 20 Reflect Festival. It's a month-long global festival celebrating and marking the 20th anniversary of the original signing of the manifesto. It is a global event, so there's events happening all over the month, as many of you are, are aware. We've had a tremendous response, and there are well over 750 events happening worldwide over the course of February. The festival was built by, by volunteers. It's been a, a truly global collaborative effort. Amazing to see so many people coming together to make this happen. Uh, we do have a, a hashtag for you there in the bottom left. So you know, if you want to share on social, if that's your thing, you know, please do. And, and please do use the hashtag. Appreciate it. And the website address is in the bottom right for you. If you want to go in there and, and have a look at some of the other content supporting the, the festival and also peruse the rest of the, uh, the festival calendar. We've also been supported kindly by a number of organisations, many of whom will be familiar to you. Um, that's some of them up there on the top of this slide. So, as we often do have with our own events, we have a code of conduct. As we're part of the, um, the Agile 20 Festival, we are all also adhering to the festival's community policy. If you'd like to familiarise yourself with that a little bit more closely, you'll find it on the website. I think there's a link to it in the footer. And as I said earlier, that the festival has been built by entirely by volunteers, um, but there is an, an opportunity to donate if you wish to do so. And again, you'll, you'll find more information about that on the website. And yep, the festival's now in full swing. We're well into week three. It's been an amazing experience thus far, but there's still plenty to go. There's stacks of events still. I've got a number of them to attend and to host and all the rest of it. And uh, yeah, it, it, it truly has been a, an amazing experience. The best February ever, I have to say. Febrys are usually, Febrys are usually pretty dull. Um, and yeah, there's the website address again. So have a look and um, yeah, I'm sure you'll find other stuff that's of interest to you. Right, I think that's all I was going to say on that front. So yeah, thanks again for joining us. Lots of familiar faces. And I'm delighted this evening to be joined by our guest speaker, Natal Dank. Uh, Natal is the co-founder of PXO Culture, where she heads up learning and coaching and community. Uh, she's also seen as a pioneer in the Agile HR movement, which is totally awesome. Uh, and of course, she's also the co-author of this awesome book, which you probably can't see because I'm a virtual background. I am genuinely holding up a copy. Oh, there you can see it there, of Natal's book. And it's brilliant. And I'm sure over the course of the session, she will give you a, there we go. She's holding it up now, a tremendous introduction. Uh, as ever, you know, we're happy to take questions. Please drop your questions into the chat. And myself and my co-organisers co will facilitate that and get those questions to Natal, really looking forward to, to learning more about Agile HR. Welcome, Natal. All yours. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, I'm very up for the, the festival feel. I was always been a festival girl myself over the years. And I can see the people partying in the picture behind you there. And, oh, God, it brings back memories. I would be full of, you know, sweat in a big tent with sweaty people again uh one day hey one day <laughs> with the bass going through the body uh. <laughs> all right so um we'll do a uh, kind of agile hr in the meantime which is just as cool and fun uh don't worry and uh so today we're going to explore the concept uh coming from a slight few different angles because i Think we're going to have a bit of a mixture of people on the call today so I'll also ask who you are and what you do soon 
The way we're going to run it is I'll, I'm going to say a few things and then I'm going to ask if you can contribute your thoughts, questions, insights on Zoom chat. And I'll kind of start feeding off that. And if there's certain kind of examples or sort of points to discuss, uh, we can go in different directions. Exactly. Agile HR is as cool as a music festival. Exactly. Uh, well, we're talking about the future of work uh, and, you know, Agile HR, I think, is a key part of making the future of work ha happen because it actually can truly revolutionise the way we go about it. HR itself might look a little bit different in the future, but I think that's a good thing. So um, let's get into it. Possibly not called HR anymore. Uh, so the human remains no longer, hey? Um, or I was on a I was on a meetup recently, and apparently they were called the useless resources. Uh, was one uh, one lady got told? Poor. <laughs> All right. Okay. So just check my uh, is you can see my screen. Yeah. Cool. All right. So there's nothing like a pandemic to uh, highlight the importance of working in an agile way. That's the the my my new quote. But what's been quite interesting uh, of with the pandemic is, as you know, huge debates around what does the future of work look like and what's going on in the HR profession as a result is really interesting. So as some of you know, I've been kind of flying the flag for Agile HR for a number of years now. But what I've seen happen now is this sort of, I think people kind of getting it and realizing, okay, yeah, my, my kind of my organization was transforming, but actually I really get why now. I get why my organization has to rapidly respond to this complexity around them. And the people part of that is so important. So what's it's been interesting to actually still meet a lot of HR professionals that are new to the topic of Agile, which I kind of thought, you know, with, it's been around for a while, so I thought people were getting more familiar, but there's still a lot of people coming to the topic in a new way. But they're getting it in, uh, getting it differently to how they're used to. And, and you know, I was on this where this this call the other day where it was about useless resources, and um, the person said, "Oh my God, this is so good. This profession really needs to revolutionise. It needs to be shaken up, and it's so great to see these kind of conversations happening. So this is a great thing." So what we're going to explore today is how do we start designing this, you know, way of working for the future and how do we help this shift, of course, away from that hierarchical pyramid structure towards the collaborative network that is so important for agile ways of working or kind of goes hand in hand. What I think is interesting is, of course, up until now, HR processes have often represented this legacy, hasn't it? So a lot of the processes, particularly in a more traditional organization, still re reflects this old way of working. Hence, HR has become a bit synonymous with this more command and control approach. And so a lot of this is how do we move away from that just in general terms in our organizational structures, but also how does people processes update um, for this as well. So of course, my point is that you need to be agile to, a, to enable agile. So until the HR profession truly partners with agile coaches and business leaders and agile teams, we won't re truly realize this vision of transformation that we're, we're wanting. And we're now, what is very exciting, uh, also challenging, is of course, agile moving beyond the traditional tech space. And what was really interesting actually is last week, I was you know fortunate enough to be part of the panel on the Scrum Alliance. And I think because I work so much in HR and kind of non-tech areas, I kind of almost thought it was a given that Agile is bigger than tech, but there was a big debate of it still being so, you know, associated to tech. So it was really interesting to see that, yes, that is still very much an issue. And, and how do we move beyond that if we really want to realize agile transformation across the whole organization and, of course, into the future of work? So part of what I do a lot and what um, I think is really necessary for the topic two transcend the tech space is for things to be translated into part other parts of the business. So again, last week, there was a debate about 
you know, do the words of the manifesto have to evolve for people to connect to it in a different way? And I'm, I'm not totally sure. There's a big debate around that. But I know definitely when I talk about agile with HR professionals, I need to translate the words and we need to make it relevant for our context of people, culture and organizational change. And so a lot of what we talk about is, OK, if we take the concept of agile with the customer at the heart of what you do, then in an agile space, this is your people and business. And how are you delivering value through to that customer, which is your people and business? But ultimately, how does that then flow through to your end customer? So this whole kind of connection, that sort of value stream. And then how do you do this, you know, deliver this value in an incremental way, which is a big change for HR, because traditionally we were this more big bang, one size fits all, you know, whole organizational solution. So how do we start to be much more incremental, test and learn in how we do it? And which is I start to call, how do you start to co-create solutions? And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Of course, then you've got the multifunctional way. So to solve complex problems, we need multifunctional teams. Now, this starts to really shake up HR because that means actually it's not just HR that needs to solve these problems. It's actually working with the business, different parts of the business, and also having people in the teams to help us test and validate solutions as they're created. For me, this is also very true about transformation. So I wanna kind of explore that tonight. How do we co-create transformation and not do it in that big bang, one size fits all um, approach? So the theme of tonight is co-creating the employee experience. How do we start to use agile values to build the solution together? So it's actually, it's a change that people are experiencing and they're part of rather than a change implemented onto people. Um, and so this is what we're trying to do even with our customer solution, you know, building a great customer journey and experience. So how do we start doing that internally in our organizations? And so that's what I, I wanna explore with you. Uh, so shout out, I, I'm Natal, so you know that, and love for you to link up with me. So link up on LinkedIn or Twitter, whatever you prefer. And that's the book. <laughs> um, but also at PXO Culture, we do loads of meetups. So we'd love to see you come over to PXO as well. And we're always, the theme's always around Agile HR. So for example, next week, I'm talking with this uh, fantastic uh, lady, Zach, um, from a startup in Australia. So you'll have two Aussies, sorry. And um, we get broader by the, by the, as the meetup progresses. Uh, but she's been doing great things uh, in the startup culture, and it's great to explore what does Agile HR look like in a startup as opposed to a more traditional organization, and we'll kind of be debating that. So lots of meetups coming up. Please come and join us. Okay, so let's get into some of the more interactive um, components. So this is to get you into the groove, and I'll be doing this several uh, sort of sections throughout tonight. Uh, well, I'll ask you to put things into Zoom chat. So the first one's pretty straightforward. What is your current role or function? You know, what, what do you want to call yourself and what you do? Um, and what's your interest in Agile HR? So for example, are you an Agile coach and you're on this call because you're looking at how you partner with HR or help, you know, redesign HR practices? Or are you in HR directly and you're looking at what does this mean if we start to embrace Agile? So it'd be great to uh, get some feedback from you. <laughs> All right, so we've got Agile Coach partnering, Agile Coach partnering call, HR looking to embrace Agile, staff engineer. What does a staff engineer mean? Can you tell me more, please? Developer role, HR partner call, Agile Coach. Excellent. Scrum Master, Coach, great. Regularly at odds with HR. Yes, I thought that would come out. So that would be, that's, that's cool. Agile and Visual Facilitator, nice. Worked in HR areas previously, so want to learn more about that. Business Agility Specialist, great. Definitely, I think that this is, this is what's so key is, is that for, to realize business agility, there is this, this people component, it's the people strategy. And so how do we 
either include all HR or move beyond what HR stands for to, to do that. Cool. Agile Manifesto, great. HR consultant, Agile enthusiast, fantastic. HR coordinator transitioning to Agile within our team to align with the rest of the company, fantastic. That's what we, we're hearing a lot of. I am a transformation consultant and would love to transform HR, cool. <laughs> COO transitioning to Agile in HR operations to align with other teams, great. Staff engineer equals recruiting developers driving the technical part of the recruiting process, cool, thank you. Okay, so we've got a good mix, uh, and I thought we would, of uh, people working more, I suppose, for want of a better word, more the, the traditional agile area of agile coaching, business transformation, business agility. And then we've got people coming from the agile, I mean, HR perspective. Um, so we've got, yep, so Tobias had so many clashes with HR over the years. I see a great desire in individuals to change, but held back by the corporate machine, definitely. So, you know, and I think HR almost represents that corporate machine sometimes, doesn't it? So I would say that when you're starting to work with HR teams, sometimes the biggest blocker is the legacy of how they've worked before. So it's um, definitely something to look at. So I wanna pick up what Tobias has just said there and some of the others. Some of the reasons I even went into this and I actually started my own meetups um, quite a few years ago in London um, at the start. And that was because I wanted to try and bring these two worlds together because we weren't understand each other very well. I myself had worked in HR and I kind of went, oh, what is this agile thing to begin with? Oh, it's just for tech. Um, and I know definitely some agile coaches were seeing HR as a blocker you know, pretty quickly once you embrace transformation, things like performance, things like reward, things like the way that you traditionally develop a team, all of these things start to truly block any kind of agile transformation. So we kind of came uh, into it in this sort of clash. Um, and a big part of this is how do we start to understand our two worlds and start to change that for the better. Um, so that's what I really kind of want where I want us to get to. But definitely first person to say, uh, there's a lot of legacy in HR that we need to just kind of let go of if we are going to actually move forward. Okay, cool, excellent. Thank you so much for giving me a taste of uh, some of the roles and some of the dilemmas. So I, that's the vision uh, in this discussion is if we worked together or combined and uh, yes, let go of the HR tag and it's agile people, agile culture, whatever we wanna start calling it, what could we truly achieve if we started to really understand each other's world and start to, to work together? And I say this because sometimes I've worked with agile coaches where they kind of just write off the whole of HR um, because we do represent this corporate machine. But actually there are people in HR that come with a lot of experience of working with people, developing people, doing organizational change. And there's so much value that we can offer, particularly if we're ready to embrace the agile values and coming at it in a more human centric way. And vice versa, there's HR that have kind of written off agile coaches because they think, oh, they're, you know, they're interfering or they're, they're, they're demanding these things and I don't understand why. And so this is how do we try and break down those barriers and really start working together. And that's where I hope we can now go um, with, with the topic and what we're doing. And for me, this is essential if personally, if we're gonna realize this transformation vision, because one thing, if you think about what I was talking about earlier is that some of the traditional legacy of HR working is this big bang, one size fits all change. And I think some of the danger around transformation is if we see it as a set model that is getting implemented um, or it's kind of a, you know, cascaded, uh, you know, uh, transformation moved through various stages on this set way of doing. And I imagine a lot of people on this call today can't stand that kind of way of approaching transformation, but we see it time and time again. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, might be some, uh, 
I'm not sure if there's a McKenzie's person online tonight, but there's, you know, there's McKenzie is selling Spotify model now into organizations as how you do agile, you know, every couple of weeks, there's so many more streams and teams added to the model. And it's this kind of set way of implementing agile. And, and, and that's a bit scary. And that's also what HR is trying to move away from. And I, this is what this concept of co-creation is about. So how do we use these, these the same concepts in transformation as well as how do we evolve HR um, to start to build um, the new agile organization? And I think what's interesting about transformation, I know we debate this, so, you know, there's what's the end point? Is there an end point? It's not necessarily end point, isn't it? So how do we see this much more as the evolutionary journey that we're continually iterating and building on? Um, and that's what the future of work stands for a lot. So context is everything. And this is something I like to talk kind of as a, or set the scene around. So if you think about performance and reward, I'm the first person to jump into, yeah, I, you know, I'm a big supporter of delinking any kind of performance ratings and definitely any kind of individual reward in particular. Um, that I'm, all, you know, I wouldn't want, I actually don't really like ratings at all. Um, I'm also a big supporter of more collective ways of doing reward and also reaching into other ways of actually recognizing people contribution. What I've seen, however, and I've been involved in a lot of projects where if you go in and you aim to do something, if you're in an organization and maybe your senior leader is very welded to pay for performance as a kind of uh, ethos, and everyone in the organization has always worked with ratings and how they give feedback. And if you go and jump immediately to this very radical way of no ratings, no bonuses, it sometimes is just too much. And it's also too much in one go. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of examples out there where managers have then gone and created their own formulas. They're kind of doing feed, you know, so they've actually recreated some of the things that you've tried to, to strip away. And so this is how the concept of incremental development, test and learn and building it with people actually becomes very uh, central to how you build new solutions in the HR space, just as much as tech and other areas. So context is king. And if you've got it, you've got to be very conscious of the culture that you're working in. So if we want to start shifting that corporate machine, we often have to think of the dial, you know, how do we start shifting it to this, this, this area, and then this area and take people on that journey. Now, definitely, if you're in a startup or a culture where you're already operating quite differently, you can go in there and, and move much more quickly. But if you're a big in a big traditional bank, and you've been using a 25 box matrix to, to assess talent, uh, you're, you know, jumping too far ahead can actually cause a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, you know, kind of controversy, and it doesn't actually work very well. So what we're trying to do in Agile HR is move away from this big bang, one size fits all, and actually being really upfront about your constraints and what kind of culture you're operating in, and how do we start to move that towards Agile values um, based on the pace that's right for that organization. And the best way to do that is actually to use Agile techniques and design thinking about What's the problem that you're trying to solve and what's the pain points and how do you now go around solving that for people? Uh, and if you start focusing on problems to solve, actually it shifts the whole conversation. So if we think about performance, why do you even do performance? What is the problem here? Um, do we even need, you know, why do we need a system around this, particularly if we're working in agile ways? So you can actually start coming at these topics in very different ways if you start talking more about business problems and where you're trying to get to for the end customer. And we're gonna come back to that. So in terms of manifesto and agile HR, it's all about people before process. And one thing that I really liked um, from the discussion last week was something that came out about purpose before productivity. So this idea of how do we build organizations with a purpose? And that's a purpose of the value you're through to the end customer, but also your wider society and your people. And how do we uh, build that in a way that's going to make our people be great at what they do so the value can flow through? Um, 
All right, so we've got one question. How does HR push back at senior leaders to change that culture? Historically, going to HR to complain about bad culture, harassment, et cetera, is like going to the KGB to complain about Vladimir Putin. Uh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> but, well, I think this is where, uh, first of all, I'm going to challenge that and say, is that every single HR team and person you've ever worked with? Um, hopefully not, but uh, not necessarily. Uh, what I would say is that within the HR profession, there's some challenges happening around how do we become much more advocates for the human again, because there was this, I think, shift over in the profession over time to be so much focused on management and management needs, as opposed to being the actual representative of the, the employing and the human. So there's a big debate of going back to that employee success. And then also, what it is, is that um, this is why we want in linking these discussions into the business problem. So there is a business problem if there is harassment going on. This is actually um, causing the business, uh, your people not performing very good, you're actually losing people, you're actually not kind of delivering value through to that end customer. So you can actually create the conversation to this is a problem that we need to fix right now for our business and our people. Alrighty. Sorry, I was reading a quite a long copy. I'll, co I'll come back to some of the comments. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, look, I think that um, this is part of it, isn't it, um, John, that the Agile HR is that uh, First of all, corporate policy, how do we shift this to be back about people and the purpose that you're doing as a, as a company? And that HR actually represents the human um, and that you need to move beyond policy because this is the thing that if it's if you're right, if you if you're going towards policy and process first and you're not representing the human and the people, yeah, then why are we having this conversation? So this is about challenging some of that, definitely. All right. So, and you can, I can read some of yours while you're, you're doing this. I'm going to flip it first, and this will be interesting because we've heard some of the more negative examples coming through, but how are Agile values reshaping HR? So are you seeing any examples or hearing any examples of a more human-centric approach uh, based on Agile coming in and influencing HR? So I'd like to hear if you're coming across any of these examples, what are you seeing? Um, and then I'll also read some of the things that have come through. Cool. All right. Sorry, I've gone quiet because I'm reading all the things that are coming in. <laughs> I just had a wee heart attack there, but I'm okay now. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. All right. So we've got some examples coming things. So we'll have a look at some of those as well as and go back to some of the debates coming in as well. I've seen some great examples recently of great co-creation with employees for a few three-year plan in certain offices, focus on sustainable working practices. I see HR trying to engage values, but struggling with getting good news culture in organization. Uh, find positive exception, identify 5% innovators use volunteering in HR. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, definitely, I would say that that's what I'm seeing is that you know, HR, HR actually, uh, Agile HR is making 
other types of people come into the profession. So a true agile HR team actually has someone from tech, someone from marketing, someone from the development team. And actually that is creating a whole new way that you approach this topic and then work with people in the business. Um, so definitely we'll come back to transparency because in the end, this is, this is part of it, isn't it? So up until now, HR policy and ways of working has been very, has not been transparent and there's a big lack of trust around that. Um, HR is there to solve employee pain points, support them, not controlling. Definitely. That's what this is all about. Um, and in my experience, HR is there to protect the company. It's not there to represent employees. And this is, this is the thing. This is what we're challenging. So I'm glad that you're bringing these experiences out. Um, and this is what we're saying is that if we don't start changing this, then we're never going to realize the agile transformation that we're talking about. Um, and I'm the first person to say, do you really need a HR department going forward? Not in the traditional sense but you need something around the people strategy, building the culture, enabling people to be the best they can be, developing teams. And this is where agile coaches are coming in. And this is where you're seeing great agile HR people start to go. And this is where, that's where I wanna start exploring. Cool. All right, and so there was one about how do you kind of, can, so there's basically that managers can have a very negative impact on a working environment and on teams, totally. And where I'm the first person to say is, you, you know, you join a company for promise and future and you leave due to bad management. Um, I think what's interesting is that, again, and this is the legacy, isn't it, that HR gets directly associated with that bad management experience. And so what is the role of HR? How do they start to be seen as someone that is challenging that and changing it and not being part of that rehiring that I know we're talking about and hiring for a different type of culture and organization. So, all right. Often common ground, empathy, interest in well-being of people, coaching skills, stay inquiry. Yeah, cool. All right, excellent. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> Plenty of debate. <laughs> okay, so we one some of the things that we're seeing, and we've and we've started to see some of the examples coming through here, which is how does actually HR move towards the concept of people experience? So this holistic approach of what's going on for our people in our organizations. And this is where you are seeing a lot of the same. Uh, kind of tools, techniques, and thinking that you're seeing in designing products and services for your end customer coming into HR. So this is how do we see it much more as an employee experience that is like a customer journey. And there's moments that matter in this customer journey. And what's interesting is that you're shouting them out now. So when I start a new job, if that moment that Matt that matters is horrible and it's it, it will truly disengage me and I want to leave that company. Um, if I have a bad management experience, then that is a moment that matters and it will truly disengage me and I want to leave that company. So this more holistic approach of what the experience people are going through at work is allowing you know, a more design way of approaching some of how we do the products and services to help people. It's also actually moving HR teams uh, definitely into that area of empathy. And this is so important. So by using techniques like design thinking, people are actually going into and doing, you know, empathy interviews, experience mapping, sitting there listening to what is the experience of work going on. I've done so many sessions now where uh, I've asked HR teams to map out one of their processes and they turn around and go, oh my God, we have built this through our HR eyes. We have not built this through our people's eyes. So these are the kinds of things that you're wanting to happen if you're gonna change HR for the better. And so this idea of building empathy, understanding the employee experience, so you then start to redesign and challenge what's going on. So this is how we try and move beyond some of the more negative experiences that are coming through. So this is for me is one of the massive big trends that Agile is influencing the HR um, profession and scene. And this is also what's going on kind of for businesses as well. If you think about coronavirus, what's been really interesting is that it has 
as we know, it's accelerated some of the trends. So you've seen a huge digitalization of the customer experience, but you've seen a massive digitalization of the employee experience. So most of us are at home now working each day through this environment. And so this is totally re-engineered how you have to actually touch into the well-being of people. So it's kind of just forced this whole reassessment of how do we actually do work and, and touch into the whole person of work. You know, I've got my dog here behind me. So the whole way that you actually engage with each other each day, you've got your kids around you, you've got your, ki um, your, your dogs. So there's this whole kind of touching into the real experience of work going on. The other key thing, and this is what I would actually like to throw out there to some of the people that have also saying, well, I've had some really negative experience of working with HR, is how do we actually now move beyond that and start collaborating together? So what does it look like if we start to build teams where we actually have business people and HR people in there working together? So there's a UK company where um, the HR business partners saw the need to move beyond just being this one person that looks after one part of the business and quite rightly often was just more kind of doing what you know working with the managers so what they decided is they join the team together and work using agile techniques but quite quickly they went and got an uh, an engineer to also join that team someone that was actually a designer to join that team and they started to uh, actually build solutions that were about products and services that that area of the business actually needed so they started to basically take on the same working approach that the teams were doing for the end customer um, and then this is what starts to really change the model and how we can go about this a big part of this of course is that if you start embracing agile values you have to work transparently and why you know we need to kind of start questioning how much information needs to be held back why would any bit of information need to actually be held back from employees if we want to enable real-time decision making. So Agile is so much about transparency of information to allow real-time response to the customer. So if you also take that principle into HR, it starts to really change things and shake things up. Um, and if you start thinking about reward and performance, why were these decisions kept quiet? What is going on here? It leads to people to, to not trust them. We're also seeing a new cadence, of course, coming in, which is um, if you think about the tradition of HR is that it's the annual cycle. So this idea of, you know, the annual cycle of performance, the annual cycle of your career development, um, the annual uh, reward review. Uh, none of this fits the way that the business operates anymore. And none of this is feeding into the kind of change of the new shape of organizations. So project, more project-based teams, skills rather than roles. Uh, how do we actually tie into the actual iterations or sprints that might be happening within the workplace? So now there's a new cadence coming into to add to HR itself around feeding into the, the directly into the business cycle. And if you're thinking about it, then if you're going to do a change around how people are working then you need to do it at a time that people can handle that change. You know, you, you can't go and do a big kind of re-engineering of how people do performance at reward at the same time that they're the, the busiest that they've ever been with the end customer. So this much more in line with what's going on with the business. Um, and we'll come back to it, but this idea of actually adding to think, to allowing people to work better rather than adding things onto how people work. So we'll kind of explore that quite soon. So ultimately it's, you know, how does a HR team or a people and culture team, whatever you want to call it, um, be seen much more as holding a portfolio of products and services that you deliver out across that business that feeds into that holistic approach to employee experience. This means you kill some processes, you maintain others, you kind of start to re-engineer and redesign um, others. You're also constantly looking at how you delight people. So just like you're trying to delight that end customer, how you are delighting people um, and how are you using evidence to manage that? So the other massive 
trend that Agile is kind of bringing into the world of HR is actually working in a more evidence-based way. And I suppose there'll be a lot of techies on the call going, what do you mean? This seems, this is a no-brainer. Of course, you should work in an evidence-based way. Where's the data? Um, I don't know if you've been aware, but uh, for people that are on the call from HR, we've often quite liked a new fad or we've maybe assumed we know the answer because we've seen it before. Or when I went into HR, we were taught that we should follow best practice. So we were taught that actually you should go and look at what Google or Facebook or a big bank has done before. And you should take that model and implement it out in how you do talent, how you do career development. So it's also this kind of challenging of where we've come from before and how do you start to design for the context and for the values of the organization rather than um, what's been done before. But also it's about testing hypothesis. So if you want to shift the dial around performance and reward, what's your hypothesis on that? And how would you actually get data that what you're going to do is, is actually going to work? So you know, I've been involved in projects where you literally go and invite different teams to test different ways of giving feedback, removing the, the process altogether and saying, okay, what happens if we allow the team to work that way themselves and allow the reviews and the retros to, to manage their own performance? What does that look like? Um, start to actually have some information to work on rather than just these assumptions and these opinions around how you redesign a lot of the people practices. And by having data, you can go to the, that C-suite and say, okay, you thought there was a, we should run a training program to answer that issue. Well, actually the data shows it's your behavior that's causing the problem. You know, people are scared to give feedback because of they're scared to talk to their manager. How do we change that? So this is how we can start to come back at some of the things that you were talking about earlier around these negative moments that matter. How do we go and get data that actually this is causing a business problem and we need to fix it rather than jump into some of the assumptions that sit around it? Okay, so I got a bit carried away in that section, so I will <laughs> move forward. Um, all right, so I would like to now move this into some of the business challenges that you're facing in your organization in the people space. So what is a HR or people practice that's in your organization that you think needs to be improved or fixed? Uh, so tell me a bit about some of the challenges that you're facing. Um, and then we can kind of talk a bit about, well, if you were to approach that in an agile way, what might that look like? Okay. Yeah, so we're getting some interesting ones. So um, we've got HR could elevate the role of teams and scrum masters and help to end management reporting practices. Walking to work in real time is the only way to remove managerial wastage. Uh, we do have a question of where does it start and end though? Employee salaries, behavior reviews, et cetera. Can HR be 100% agile? So we'll come back to that one. That's a good one. Sometimes HR has first experiences with agile service product development, e.g. training, learning development, can extend from there, definitely. So what you often see is that HR comes into agile because parts of the organization start to transform. And we've got some people online today in that. And so then there's questions around these traditional practices of you know, how you do some of the performance, the reward, the career development. And so there's some, there's needs to start evolving that to allow agile to happen or yeah, quite rightly take, you know, remove it altogether and allow the agile ways of working to, um, to, to, to manage its own performance, um, deliver value in its own way.
All right, so we've got organizations don't see in brackets yet the need to move HR to agile. How do we make, how do we convince them? Okay. Come back to that one. Data driven challenging in HR because of the often long delay between intervention and effect. Also, rarely mono casualty um, makes cause and effect relationship debatable. Yeah, I think that's an interesting one, Peter. So, what um, there's definitely the delay. And so what I would say is that uh, measurement, you need to be very upfront about what you're measuring at what stage and, and when. Um, also, what I'm talking about is how do you even make it some really basic prototyping of solutions where you're literally getting kind of first reaction before you even go towards uh, creating a solution that you then start to implement and test a bit more longer term. So actually testing constantly as you start to iterate and build it out, it gives you more of a chance of collecting that data as you go. Because yes, if you've got something where you want behavioral change, it's gonna take six months to a year sometimes to really see that come through. So how do you set it up in a way that you can constantly checking data and getting immediate feedback uh, at each stage to at least be validating that you're on the right track? Um, because this, I think this is also what's interesting about HR. There's a lot of subjectivity in a lot of the stuff that happens around people processes. Um, and so we are we got to be upfront with that, but also how do we also move beyond from that? Okay, how do we get some data to make some decisions so it's not just based on these assumptions and feelings of people? Okay, so some of the things we've got. We've got, um, I'm working in an extremely, I think, PM-centered, so performance management-centered organization where they make Project decisions. Manager. Project manager, okay. Um, project management centered organization where they make decisions without enough background. What do we mean by that, Ferdinand? And I can. Oh, the, the, I, I work as a technician. I, I develop software and usually decisions on technology I, are made by project managers instead of made by people that understands technology. Yeah, so... okay. So how do we how do we evolve that? Okay, that's a nice one. Okay, cool. Excellent, excellent. Um, we've got how do performance evaluation not linked to bonus and economic rewards? Yep. So how do you actually have a performance conversation that doesn't link to actually what people are paid um, or what how people are awarded? Great. That's a good uh, good challenge to have. Um, my immediate answer is to delink it straight up, but um, that can be a bit of a forceful change but at least just delinking it and then going and exploring how you help performance uh, feedback conversations get better and then go and explore rewards separately. What does that actually mean for people and what can it link to at least is a great starting point. Um, I hear about legacy culture and constructive areas, siloed areas, no cross-functional teams. Yep, so date breaking down silos, definitely a key business challenge. Uh, international mobility or within US in a COVID era, how to manage pay for people who are no longer in the expensive location. Yes. Um, so we're seeing that a lot, aren't we? So we're seeing how do you hire talent across the globe? Um, but this idea where talent in one location is more expensive than another, how do you either make that fair um, and how do you ensure that you can hold both talent uh, and, and kind of give them a kind of fair kind of recognition for their efforts. Um, HR is seen as experts in people processes. So it's difficult for them to be seen as they don't know or that they need to test hypotheses. Yeah, I think that's an interesting one. So this idea that, um, but is that not the same for lots of parts of the business? So whenever, you know, this idea of, you know, if you're working on a solution and you're seen as the expert, being open to the fact that you don't have enough data yet to, to know that this is the right way to go, I think that that is agile, isn't it? So I think the more that HR can embrace the concept of agile of, I'm, I'm experienced in this space of work, but I don't have the answers because I have to go and find the data and get the evidence of what to do, is just a much better way um, um, of going about it. 
Okay, management rely heavily on measurement against competency for their team members as they see it as fair for everyone when relating to financial reward. How do you remove this whilst team members feeling there will be a fair approach across the teams? Yeah, so that, so this idea of what do you actually link reward to? Um, is it competency? Is it levels of mastery? Is it uh, skills? Is it outcomes? Uh, is it performance ratings? Um, and I think we all know where we're uh, coming from there. So that's a really good one. So let's take those challenges and now think about if we were to apply some agile values around uh, approaching how to solve them, what might that look like? So up until now, a lot of HR people have solved business problems thinking like HR. So I'd now like you to think about the business problem that you've just talked about. If HR did it in a more traditional way, what might be the solution that, that is implemented? So we probably would have a competency framework, I would say for the one that I just read out, a competency framework that's also linked to pay, pay salary grades. And there'd be this huge kind of matrix um, Gantt chart around how to manage it. Spot on. <laughs> Performance measures, annual review, definitely, yeah. Put people in an Excel sheet, definitely. Okay, so incentivize teams, ask the team to vote on how bonus is shared. Individual reward, experiment on different ways of doing performance evaluation and rewards, yeah. So I think what um, this conversation starts to bring out is that if we keep doing the way we've done it, then nothing's gonna change. And if we look at the process and we just start re-engineering that same process, nothing shifts. So this is how do we actually move totally beyond that and actually start looking at how do you build pre people practices in a totally new way. Um, and this is where we're trying to go with Agile HR. How do you really start to either, you know, so I've seen some organizations remove the whole pro performance process altogether and then start with a conversation around why would you even want to talk about performance? What are we trying to achieve with this? So there was actually a really nice Scottish example quite recently where they did that and the team said, well, what we want is we, we like to talk about goals and where we're going and we like to get feedback around career development and what we can do. But we don't want to get ratings. We don't need to have these performance discussions and we don't feel like we have to write everything down in a system. So what they created was a process that was much more about not a problem, you use whatever you do in your flow of work to record your goals and how you're working. And you do that either on, you know, your, in your team, linking to your scrum boards or your digital kind of ways of communicating. And then once a year, you have, we're asking you to have a more, a conversation that represents the kind of the feedback discussion on how you're going with your career and where you want to go. But of course, we'd like you to do that more, but there's just once a year that you actually record something um, in a system as such. And so this was very interesting. And this, and then reward was then considered something that was separate and was looked at how do we start to link that much more to outcomes? Uh, yes, they started to look at if teams had a pot of money, how would they in, give it to each other and recognize each other? What would that look like? Um, so these are the kind of ways that you could start to re-engineer if you come at it in a to in totally fresh eyes. But that does mean that you've got to, you've got your senior leaders need to be ready to take that journey as well. So this is where I'm saying is you've got to make this a business problem. You know, our business is held back by a performance process that no, that is over-engineered, that is a waste of people time and is not actually getting people to be good in their job. So how do you come at this differently? OKRs of the future. <laughs> so what if we solve this business problem with an agile mindset? So first of all, it, how, how do we make it customer centric? So based on employee and business needs, not previous assumptions, validated through data and feedback. So I saw that 
Tobias was also kind of debating, is it truly that we can do these data decisions? Uh, is, should it be more on principles and values? Well, we need to be very sure of what those principles and values are. So therefore we need to go and spend time talking about that and being comfortable that that is gonna guide certain decisions. But then we also need some data around meeting those values and principles. So we do need a bit of both. Um, one of the, some of the data can be quantitative as well as qualitative, can't it? So how do we actually start tapping into both of these? Also in the world of HR, it's about being evidence-based in the sense of drawing on research that's happening out there about how do you do things in organizations differently? What's going on in the academic space around these topics? So it's moving beyond a set kind of solution um, or perhaps even buying a product in that dictates the performance. So a lot of you probably engaged with performance management processes that are based on a, um, a set kind of tech solution that is bought. And this is one of the biggest issues that we have in HR sometimes when we go about redesigning things. So um, I've been in a, a, a kind of an example, I was doing a, a re-engineering performance and reward project. And in one part, I said, all right, let's experiment with using this app where you give each other feedback. And because they were tech, techie people, I thought they're going to love it. You know, this is an app that's going to help them give each other feedback. This is the solution. They, of course, hated it. And they said, we don't need an app. We need a psychological safe space to give each other feedback. And actually, it's more about the link to, to the ratings and the money at the time. So this brought out a lot of data that helped us to then go and actually change it in a different way. And actually, the tech solution was not the answer. In the past, potentially, a HR professional would have rolled that tech solution out across the organization as the way to now do performance. And so this is also how do we start challenging some of these set solutions that come in in these areas. The next one is define value. So this is interesting when you start talking about value definition with people in HR. And traditionally, we have talked a lot about maybe employee engagement, uh, which is sometimes being measured by a survey. And we all know that the survey itself is not a measurement, you know, it's actually even just a starting point of a conversation. So how would you actually start to define and then measure value? And in particular, value to different parts um, across the organization. So if you think about the business challenge that you've put in there, so we had you know, decreasing silos, uh, changing the performance management system. Um, we had uh, changing the product, what is it? The product management um, ways of deciding what to do by the project managers. If you were to solve this problem, what would be the value through to the business bottom line? What would be the value to the end customer? And what is the value to the employees? And what's interesting is if you start challenging uh, HR teams and also the C-suite around these different areas, it actually changes the conversation. And it allows you to start linking the performance problem to delivering value to that end customer. Because if it's seen that the performance management process is holding people back from delivering value to that end customer, uh, getting in the way of their work, or actually incentivizing the wrong types of behaviors, this means you can actually start to have a reason for changing it in a different way. So this is also starts to change the conversation. So a good thing to think about is how do you shift the conversation and start talking about value through to the end customer by fixing this people problem that you have in the business. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up now. <laughs> Sorry, I've got so excited by uh, various debates going on in, in the chat. So I've uh, got a bit uh, out of control with my uh, <laughs> conversation. Um, but we, so we've got uh, innovate within constraints. So uh, this is a big one. So uh, often, HR solutions in the past have been designed to meet constraints. So if you think about it, to meet compliance, to collect certain data, to meet a regulatory need, rather than the experience that the user is going through the employee. So yes, you still need to know your constraints and you need to be sound them out very clearly. 
but let's go and design the solution based on the problem for the people and the user experience. And then we assess that we've met those various needs around compliance and regulatory um, rights. It's actually generally there. So the, uh, you know, I keep coming back to performance in this one, but a lot of performance processes were designed to collect certain data. And you may have heard some people say, oh, but if there's a low performer, you need data to show that they're a low performer and you, you can kind of take action. First of all, that never happened. Secondly, uh, those kind of things never went to a tribunal. Thirdly, managers didn't really want to give a low rating anyway because they feared away from that in the system. Uh, and any kind of low performance often has other factors connected to it. And you should be just having a real time conversation around why is this going on and working through it. So designing a system for all these what ifs or the low performer creates the wrong kind of approach. And so this is where we need to move beyond these constraints um, and start innovating for the user experience of work. The next one is fight the process way. So if you take your business challenge, what if you started to look at the flow of work? So how do we tap more into how people are already working and building solutions around supporting that rather than adding on to the process of work? And so I keep, you know, performance again, why do we actually need the system? Because if you're, you, if you're using great retrospectives, great reviews, you're talking about performance every way, you've got your work transparently in front of you and you're prioritizing based on value, do you need an added system onto that? Or is it that you, HR should be helping that happen each day and be as best it can be? So these are the things that we start to try and explore. Also, how do you build it in a transparent way? So all of these solutions, if you flipped it and actually had all the information available, suddenly it becomes a different kind of beast. So by working from the position of transparency, you actually you automatically improve perceptions of fairness. So what's really interesting about when you talk about reward, if you, even before you make changes about how it's actually decided and divvied up, if you just share information on how it's decided and what goes on around each pay decision, people actually start to trust it more because they feel like they, they know why and what's happening and they can actually talk about it. So some of this is actually allowing some of these topics to just be talked about and making them less the taboo and more of the how do we evolve this for the organization. And of course, treat people like adults. So rather than writing a policy of what not to do, why don't you say, this is where we want to go to, and this is definitely going back to the values and principles. This is what we represent. This is what we're trying to achieve an organization. We trust you to make a decision based on that. Uh, you definitely step in when someone doesn't, but if you, again, start from that principle, it really shifts the way you start to design solutions. We talked about incremental development, and I think all the issues that have come through today are really interesting. If you went and did a big bang solution with any of those, you would probably get the wrong result. You need to be in there incrementally building it, testing and learning. And that's also getting some data. Is this right? Are people actually giving you the feedback that this is going in the right direction? Do we need to change um, and you know, take in the feedback and move differently as a result? And then ultimately harness the agile ways of working that are working in the business. So again, how do we go into that flow of work and build ways to help people be great at what they're doing, as opposed to implementing things on top of what they're doing to actually feel like we're controlling it more. We don't need to, we actually need to just harness the agile ways of working in the business. Okay, so. There were so many comments, so I got a little bit lost on what to actually uh, comment on. And Natal, uh, you, would you like me to sift some stuff out? We, yeah, we normally definitely. do that, but you, you were doing such a tremendous <laughs> job of working through it yourself. And I was having some technical issues, so I was like, wow, well, this is great. I don't have to do anything now. <laughs> right, let, 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 let me have a quick look through them because we, we've, got, okay. we've got 20 we've minutes. We've got a couple so... of down. Yeah, we had ah, one cool. good, it's quite good a lot HR stuff. be 100% agile. So I'll come, I can come back to that one. Yeah, well, you could pick that one up now if you want, because I, I think that that's, I guess, quite interesting, because you were talking there about test and learn, and, and my my sort of point of curiosity would be 
traditionally HR operations, you know, they're they're not they're not ex- they're not kind of that experimental. You know, they they kind of work within certain obviously regulations and policies and procedures. I've never really worked with HR colleagues who were who had a kind of experimental mindset or were prepared to just test stuff and learn things. Yeah. It's, totally. it's very black. It was very black and white, sort of. It is. It is. It is. And I think. And I think what's interesting is that definitely I'm getting a feeling that there's a few people on this call that's never worked with a HR team that's even thinking of working like this. Um, and then we've got people on the call that are in HR that are giving this a go. So all different kinds of comments are coming through. Um, and it's exactly that. So if you, you know, it is a totally different picture if your HR team embraces an experimental mindset um, and actually starts from that position. And my kind of own story was I was almost, I was kind of forced to do that without really understanding what it was all about to begin with. So I was fortunate enough, one of my first kind of, um, kind of jobs or assignments in this space was helping to evolve performance and reward for a fully agile part of the organization. And what was interesting is I did what you often do. I went and looked at the engagement survey. I interviewed a few people. I looked at best practice and I designed a solution. And I then presented that. And quite rightly, the head of IT said, well, how do you know it's going to work? You know, where's your data? You've got to experiment. You've got to, we go and test this and we get some data and then we start making decisions. Um, So I was very fortunate because I could then go into uh, an area where you had teams that if I said, oh, would you be willing to experiment with doing feedback differently because there's a problem here? They said, yeah, because what's interesting is I think HR get fearful of, first of all, people won't want to give them time. But if it's a problem that they are concerned about, they want to be involved and they want to be part of testing things and giving feedback on that. But secondly, you've got to be really upfront about listening to that feedback and be really transparent about what doesn't work. So um, if something doesn't work, you need to say, okay, yeah, we won't go any further with that because, you know, obviously that hasn't worked for you and we need to try something different. So it's a very different way of working. um, But if you embrace it, it's so much more powerful. So I think that would definitely be the starting point. Um, if you actually truly prototype and test, and I'm talking about, um, so for example, there is a, a UK company and one of the issues they were looking at was career development. So how do we start to help people develop their careers, particularly once they've been with the organization for a while? And this was a massive organization. So they did a design sprint. And first of all, they went and did some empathy interviews and they discovered that career development didn't leak didn't link to competency. It didn't link to training programs. Often for people, it linked to the team they were working with, um, the the desire to have a mentor. Um, Only for some people, it was the next kind of job that they were going to do in the progression up the ladder. So the whole concept of what career development was changed for them. Um, And so then they started to look at, well, what are problems to solve based on this? And one of them was it linked into this kind of way of helping people understand opportunities that were in the business more and kind of start to build their own kind of way of developing different skills to take up those opportunities. But they went and actually prototyped things on cardboard before they even went to the next stage of actually developing a solution to then prototype and test. So they were literally experimenting the whole time that they were doing it. And so this more iterative way means that we're more likely to build something that is co-created rather than any type of upfront solution. And so it's just, yeah, it's a fundamentally different way of doing it. Um, And I think if you start from that point, then yeah, designing products and services can be like the products and services we design for customers using Agile, for sure. Right. I like like Scott's question, because this is going to be interesting later in the week. It's asking about an Agile HR manifesto. Yeah, well, there is one. Uh, There's actually two versions, um, and it's all very controversial. (laughs) So um, I, I, and this is where I've actually now got to the point where I'm not sure you rewrite things, because Mm. what happened is people started to debate the words that were sitting in this HR Agile Manifesto, rather than the purpose and the intention and what we're trying to do with it. 
So I've actually reverted back to, you know, using the manifesto itself and then having conversations around what does each one mean in the world of HR? So taking each value and then talking about examples of how that comes out in HR and how could you go about it, you know, um, and it, it easily relates, you know, the individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Okay, what does that look like? People before process, how do you go about that? What, how do you build solutions in that way? So, um, yeah, so I've now, for that reason, I've, I've kind of gone back from this idea of rewriting it because people get very caught up in the, the right words to use rather than the intent of what we're trying to get at. No, that was good. No, I'm glad. I'm glad you said the point about, you know, when you look at the the, the the manifesto and the values and the principles, you do have to apply it to your context. And I don't think enough people say that or think like that. You know, they read it very literally. Same as thing like Scrum Guide. It's the same. It's the same kind yeah. of thing. So no, it's yeah. really good. No, you just got me thinking. You, I don't know if you know. You, you probably do. But just on your point around the man, the point on the manifesto. We're doing this ethics panel discussion later in the week, so yeah, I hope yeah. I hope you might join that. It's quite late, Definitely, but yeah. uh, we touched on it, so I think there's some some, I guess some probably some related points there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, just um, definitely, and I think it's about um, you know, and I think this is so you know we've got to get kind of you know there's been these debates of tonight. Can you use data or does it is it more about values and principles? Well, you've got to be very clear on what they are. And so we've got to come together and be, you know, and kind of be kind of joined up and share the same vision of what that looks like. And so if we're constantly re-engineering the words, I don't know if we're ever going to get to that point. So that's why yep. I think it's about having what we've got and then start to translate it into different parts of the business. Um, we've got someone here that said they wanted and some examples of a company that's implemented, um, hey, HR Agile. So a good one, you know, because we've talked a lot about performance and reward. Um, so one where they uh, they had a C-suite that didn't think there was anything wrong with performance and reward. Um, but of course, uh, feedback from the people was that there's a, a process here that we don't, we feel like it's adds on to our, our ways of working. We've got to use this system that doesn't add any value. And if, you know, our feedback is all related to ratings and, and bonus figures. So they did use this more evidence-based approach where they set, went to the C-suite and said, look, there is research out there that shows that, you know, connecting feedback to, to numbers creates more of a fear state. There is also um, data to show that our people find this a cumbersome, time-consuming process, and it gets in the way of delivering value to our end customer. So can we run an experiment in one part of the business to look at how we could do this um, differently? So uh, they then went in and in one part of the business, they delinked that you know, individual ratings with uh, salary and bonus figures. They then went and looked at, okay, what do you do if you create reward linked to collective outcomes? Um, they did, they started with this idea of, okay, based on roles, everyone gets a certain percentage based on outcomes. So we can debate on that, what that looks like. But they also started to look at, well, how do you engage managers in a different way about talking about people's performance? So rather than ratings, they went and had these sessions with the managers of, okay, if you um, if you had to let someone uh, if you if you if you were told that you needed to lose people, what would that mean? You know, if you wanted to um, promote someone, what would they need to get to that next stage? What happens? Um, you know, if you were to hire someone into a new role, who would you choose and why? What what kind of behaviors are they displaying? So they started to change the conversation and getting managers to talk to each other about what was happening for their teams, what did they need, and what kind of coaching support did they need? The other one is they went and did a lot around career development. So how do they start to build solutions around helping people feel rewarded and recognized in other ways? They even started to play with, okay, could teams have a pot of money where they could reward and recognize each other for great things that they're doing, all of this. What happened is they ran that experiment for six months. 
And the net promoter score for that part of the business actually shot up. So suddenly they had some actual end customer kind of metrics to show that if you do this differently, it works. And what people were saying is that, yeah, I actually understand better where I'm going and I understand my, my performance and I feel that I'm rewarded and recognized and they too don't have to relate. And actually I feel better in my job. I feel more comfortable. I trust the conversations I've got and this is better for me. So after that, they then actually went and did this across the organization. So it's an example of how you can use that more test and learn approach to look at what might work and then start to build it out there. Um, so that would be one example. And you can read about that in the book. Ah, it's in the book. Ah. <laughs> I'll have to take your word for that. I'm not, I'm not far enough in yet. <laughs> I'm I'm about to start I'm about to start chapter eight on the value prioritization toolkit piece. (laughs) You've uh, HR products and services. So brilliant. You've definitely reminded me. I need to need to get my finger out and uh, crack on and get reading. But no, it's great. Uh, We've we've got we've probably got time for a couple more questions. Anything anybody's particularly interested to ask Natal? We've still got our pick our brains about your own challenges within your orgs. Anything specific to things you've seen? Nothing else, shameless plug. That's all right. We'll plug your book anyway. Uh, <laughs> so someone said, would you provide? Yeah, so the meetups that we do, you can yeah, just, that was you just come to PXO Culture. Um, so here I'll put it up, pxoculture.com. And um, all the meetups that we do on Agile HR are there. Uh, and we try and do at least a couple every month. So I've got, I've, got, I've got one for you then. Since I missed your, your appearance at the, the Future of Agile panel at the Scrum Alliance event, how, 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 how was that experience and how did, you, how did you feel about sharing your, your passion and your pioneering work in Agile? And, and how did that sit alongside the other topics? This was in the Scrum Alliance panel. Yeah, right? yeah, in the panel. Yeah, because yeah, I only no. just saw it earlier today and I thought, how did I miss that? <laughs> um, so it was it was cool. And I think, um, you know, I think some people have said, I'm, I'm, you know, I truly believe that we can create a more human-centric pr- approach to how we work. And I think what, what also shows about the debates coming through tonight is that there's no clear one way of answering. It's very complex. And but only, and by working together, we can get there. And what I am seeing is, you know, if we think about the hybrid office, so this is a big debate at the moment. So how would, how do you do the hybrid office? What might this look like in the future? And this is, um, you know, some people want to go back to the office. Some people never want to go back again. You know, some people need to go to the office. They can't be at home. So what does this look like? There has been some nice examples in countries where they've actually gone back to the office, so um, so not ours yet, um, where they've done more this co-creation approach. And what was interesting, the one I was really uh, talking about recently, is Friday ended up being the day that people wanted to be in the office. And I think traditionally we would never have thought of that. But Friday for them was more the relaxed day. It was the day that you'd like to see other people, be a bit more sociable and do things like a town hall or meetings with other people and so, or something more creative. So, and then Thursday ended up being their deep work day. So we want to have a day where it's deep work and not even an executive can interrupt me. And so there's this sort of commitment at this company that Thursday's the deep work day, Friday's the, the, the in the office day. And then the other days are these mixtures around teams creating their own working agreements about what works for them. Who, you know, who, if you need to be in the office, why, what does that look like? How do you all be available at certain times so you can communicate digitally, these kind of things. So I just think that there's a real power here that if you do embrace agile values in how you build the people solutions, you can just get such better results. And um, so it was really nice to talk about that. And I think it was, it was interesting because some of the, there was a social justice person on and Mm. again, you can see a lot of these agile values coming out of how do you build a better social uh, response to what we're doing in the world? Um, But then you had like Joe Justice from Tesla and things like this. So there was this kind of 
there's also this challenge around, well, Agile is also getting linked to efficiency, productivity, you know, and making money. So where's the human in that? So I, I just liked that we were exploring those elements. And, yeah. and I think a big part of this is, yeah, it's making money, but for a purpose and you've got to, and it's got to be good for you and society. And we've got to hold those values when we're, we're when we're embracing Agile. Yeah. Fab. No, that's a, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice place to uh, probably bring it to a close. There, you, you, you've been for all, you've been phenomenal. You, you closed it nice. <laughs> Often I ask for closing remarks, but I didn't even have to do that today. No, that that was fab, and you you did field a lot of questions, and you did a great job of sifting through the chat window <laughs> while I was desperately trying to fix my tech issue. So <laughs> kudos, right. we had kudos. Stream, I think that's the thing. We had like, you know, oh my God, HR's the worst ever through to, no, this is the future. We can do it that's better. It. So uh, it. always I... interesting to have that kind of debate, which is No, good. brilliant. It's <laughs> not spot on. I totally agree. Listen, just, just to say thank you for joining us. It's been Pleasure. fab to host you. Uh, excellent session. Um, and yeah, thanks. Yep. And uh, yeah, a round of applause for you there. For everybody who wants to unmute and join me, they're welcome to do so. Thank you so much, the, se the, se the second of our Agile 20 Reflect sessions. That was great, Natal. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. And I hope I might see you at the ethics session on Friday. All right. I'm going to move back to gallery view so I can see everyone again. Hi, right, folks. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, another Thank great you. session. Thank you for Natal for joining us. And thanks for you all for uh, your participation. It was, it was fab. Tremendous engagement as ever. Um, we have another event for you in early March with Dr. Charlie Cartwright, who will be joining us from the US. He's the CEO of the People Success Labs. So he's got a fascinating session lined up for us. And Donald and Nicola and I are well on our way to finalizing the rest of our plans for March. So those will be publicized fairly soon. So look out for them. And of course, as this is an Agile 20 uh festival event um just encourage you to continue to have a look on the calendar there's still a ton of stuff to to enjoy there's events covering a wide spectrum of subjects i've still got a ton of events to go to to speak at to host it, it, it you know there's still a lot to get through before we get to the end of feb so you know look out for stuff that's about to be something for you and i dropped uh, a link to feedback form um, it'd be great if some of you would be kind enough to perhaps complete that, take out a few minutes. That would be that would be greatly appreciated by the festival team. We're asking those, you know, to all the events to, to to feed some back so we can keep improving and building on this stuff. Uh, so if you've got a few minutes, be much obliged if you could complete that. Uh, and yeah, keep looking out for other stuff. If this is the first time you you've joined us at Future Work, I hope you had a great a great session, and uh, we'll see you back. And uh, yeah. Look after yourselves, take care, all the best, and uh, enjoy the rest of Agile 20 Reflect. And uh, yeah, buy Natal's book. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, folks. Take care, all the best. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Natal. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Party. Thank you.